into this lesson we commit ourselves into your hand we commit the the teacher into your hand we commit those who have not yet joined that lord god you quicken their footsteps we also pray that lord give us the best internet connection and whatever we are going to share during this lord god let it create impact in our life and let it bear fruit we pray and declare all this in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit amen amen thank you so much you're welcome all right so last week if you remember uh, we had looked at chapters 5 and 6 and in chapter 6 we spent a little time looking at the events that took place at the um, feast of tabernacles so um, we looked at some of the ceremonies that are uh, you know connected with the feast of tabernacles uh, we saw the importance that was given uh, to uh, you know the the water which was ceremonially poured out on the altar uh, and then they had a, a decoration of lamps in the in what was technically called the court of the women uh, so there would be uh, large lamps lit up over there and we also saw that that this is the feast where uh, the people choose to uh, build small tents and stay in that uh, just to remind themselves of how god was them uh, was there with them when they were traveling in the wilderness and how he provided for them uh, so we looked at this background and actually this chapter is a continuation of that um because we saw that uh, jesus talks about how he is the uh, water you know uh, the one that can quench our thirst um, they used to pour out water on the altar for the ceremony uh just to remind themselves of how god provided water in the wilderness but now jesus proclaims and says the water which i give um uh, you know uh, will be will provide eternal life and so he offers spiritual waters uh and now when we come into this chapter we see him touching upon the other aspect of this feast uh where he uh, also portrays himself as the light of the world uh so both of these things uh him being the water of life and him being the light of the world both these concepts are directly connected with that feast of tabernacles uh, which was celebrated it's just that the way these chapters are arranged um they kind of bring in a story right in the middle of this you know it kind of breaks the flow of thought um and um so in some bibles this additional passage which comes in between uh, is uh, you know placed in brackets so if you check in your bibles most bibles will show uh, that john chapter 7 the very last verse verse 53 um is put in brackets and you have a bracket leading all the way up to verse uh 12 i think isn't it up to verse 11 so uh, from john 753 up to uh, chapter 8 verse 11 that is in some bibles it's put in brackets uh, because there has been some controversy regarding this particular passage uh, which deals with the uh, adulterous woman who's brought uh, in front of jesus uh, to be stoned to be judged now um in many of the ancient manuscripts uh, you know which are existing even today and which we have been able to you know discover um in many of them this particular portion um is kind of placed in in the middle of asterisk marks in some uh, cases they put a bracket so it's as if these uh, people who you know uh, were copying out these ancient manuscripts they wanted to convey the idea that um, this was not really the original placement of this particular passage and most probably it should have been you know placed somewhere else so maybe they began to place this particular portion here because maybe this particular incident took place at this particular point of time chronologically 
um, we see that Jesus talks about how he is the water of life. And then it says that all the people went home. So Jesus also leaves and goes. And then uh, if you come to uh, verse 11 of chapter 8, uh, he says that, you know, um, at dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts. So maybe in between the earlier passage and this passage, maybe this particular incident regarding the adulterous woman takes place. Um, in John chapter 7, when he's talking about how he is the water of life, we do see that it's, uh, you know, it describes over there and says that this was the last day of the feast. So technically, the feast is now finished. And uh, so maybe on the next day is when the event with the uh, adulterous woman took place. Um, we're not very sure. And maybe the day after that is when you have him talking about how he is the you know um, uh, light of the world. So we don't really know the um, sequence of events. But for some reason, in many of these ancient manuscripts, this particular passage has been placed in the middle of asterisk marks or you know bracket marks, um, as though to indicate that this has been taken from somewhere else and placed over here. So in some of those old manuscripts, in fact, you would find this particular passage being placed at the very end of the Gospel of John, you know, after uh, John chapter 21. Um, in some of those manuscripts, it's placed at the end of chapter 8. Uh, so based on that, some people have said, maybe this was not really originally scripture. Maybe this was just something which people added to the scripture later on. But when we look at all these ancient manuscripts, you know, which were so carefully copied down by hand and preserved, um, if these people had not regarded this as part of the original scriptures, they would not have bothered to even you know, include it. So the reason that they have made it a point to include it and put in those bracket marks shows that they regarded this passage as being inspired word of God, but the placement probably you know um differed so in some places we we see it placed in a different portion of this gospel so maybe because of that they put in the bracket marks so i don't really think we should be questioning the uh, authenticity or you know the inspirational uh, character of this passage uh, i personally believe that this passage is also very much inspired scripture just like the rest of the other uh, chapters that we find. Uh, I think that uh, the brackets which have been placed in the ancient manuscripts is more regarding the uh, placement. They were trying to maybe establish the sequence of events, which is why they bring in this um, you know, um, passage right in the middle of the water passage and the passage which talks about Jesus being the light. Uh, so you know, th that um, is my belief. Uh, we will, you know, just leave it at that. Um, now, for those who say that this may not be genuine scripture, uh, even if someone were to take that stand, we don't really lose any important spiritual principles because the things which Jesus said over here in this passage we see him saying those things uh, and doing those things even in other places, you know, because we know how he dealt with another woman who had been involved in uh, immoral behavior. And uh, with her as well, you know, he shows her mercy. He gives her another opportunity to uh, live a righteous life. Uh, so we see something similar taking place in, in another uh, portion of the Gospels. So the principle that comes out here in this passage is also brought out in other places. So even if we were to you know, uh, not wish to focus on this passage, what has been taught over here about how God treats those who have, who have had an immoral past, how he gives them a second chance, is explained in other places as well. And we also see that in this passage, it's more a trap that is being laid for Jesus. And Jesus very cleverly counteracts what is, you know, what they are trying to do. 
And we see the same concept even in other passages where Jesus turns the tables on these uh, Pharisees and uh, religious leaders. So even if someone were to say that they do not want to you know, focus at all on this passage and meditate upon it, the things which are presented here in this passage are also repeated in other places in the gospel. So um, we don't really miss out on any of the important spiritual teachings. But anyway, because we uh, do regard this as part of the inspired scriptures, we will look at this passage from um, 753 all the way up to 811. Maybe we could have someone read out for us uh, 753 and then uh, six verses of chapter 8. We'll, we'll begin with that. We'll focus on that and then we'll move on to the rest of the verses. So 753 to chapter 8, verse 6, please, if someone could read out for us. Yeah, if we can open our Bibles uh, to John chapter 8, and if someone could please read out for us um, John chapter 7, verse 53, all the way up to eight, verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 6. John chapter 7, verse 53, yeah. and everyone went to his own house. John chapter eight but jesus went to the mount of olives now early in the morning he came again into the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them then the scribes and pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery and when they had sat set her in the midst they said to him teacher this woman was caught in adultery in the very act now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Yeah. So, when so um, um, we see here in uh, verse 6, it is explained to us, the readers, that they have not come over here. The leaders have not brought the lady over here to Jesus because they are so concerned about the righteousness of God being preserved. Rather, they have brought the lady here to set a trap for him, for Jesus, because they wish to accuse him. Uh, what is the trap over here? Uh, it's pretty simple. Um, the Mosaic law taught that someone caught in adultery would have to be stoned to death. And so... Um, if Jesus were to say, yes, you know, let's go ahead and stone her, uh, if he were to uphold the Mosaic law in that manner, then they could get him into great trouble with the Romans, with the Roman authorities, because actually the Israelite people no longer had the legal authority to give a death sentence to anyone. You would need Roman approval to be able to give a death sentence to anyone at all, especially if it involves something like stoning. Um, of course, they ignored this rule later on, you know, when Stephen was being stoned. Uh, but then, of course, by then, the situation had heated up. There was a lot of political insurgency going on and all of that. We'll not go into those details. But right now, at this point of time, you know, um, in the time of our Bible passage, uh, there was still much peace in the land. And so at that time, the people would have hesitated to break the law and stone someone without Roman permission. Uh, so uh, their hope was that they could get him into trouble with the Roman authorities. On the other hand, they were aware that Jesus was someone who showed a lot of compassion and mercy. So it was quite likely that Jesus would rather give this person a second chance rather than stone them. So in that case, they could you know, accuse him and say, oh, you are breaking the Mosaic law. You are not upholding the law. So whichever response Jesus takes, uh, they would get a chance to accuse him. Uh, so we see that as the trap. Another aspect of the trap is that we see that only the lady is brought. Now, when you say adultery, it obviously means there are two persons involved. So what about the man 
you know, who was involved in the adultery, why was he not brought? So the chances are that they have conspired and this man was recruited to engage in this act of adultery so that, you know, they can, um, while he is uh, with the lady, they can come and capture her and bring her. So this is probably, a, you know, a, a pre-planned scheme. So they did not produce the man because if Jesus starts cross-questioning the man, then all the, and the entire story would come out. So only the lady is brought over here. So you see, it's a well laid out trap, uh, but Jesus being all wise and, you know, and moving in the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, he takes care of the situation in the right manner. What is Jesus' immediate response when this um, allegation is made? It says in verse six, um, you know, um, they, uh, it says that they laid a trap in, uh, in order that they may accuse him. And then it says in the last part of verse 6, but Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. So he just simply ignores what they are saying. He doesn't even bother replying. And then verse 7, you know, confirms that. And it says, when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, you know, and then you have the rest of the dialogue. So Jesus does not even bother to take their question seriously. They continue to question him and only then he straightens up and speaks to them. So why did they have to go on questioning him? What was Jesus doing that was so important? What was it that he was writing? And then you have a lot of different theories regarding that. Nothing is mentioned in scripture itself. So whatever we say, it will be pure hypothesis. I have my own theory, uh, you know, which again is a theory. So, you know, you, you can either accept it or, you know, you may, uh, you can choose to accept the other theories which are there. Um, it says in the first portion, you know, in uh, verse, in chapter eight, verse two, at dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. So the reason that Jesus has come over here early in the morning is because, you know, people come at that time um, to the temple and uh, they he, he has come over there to teach them. And so he's probably writing something on the ground, uh, which is connected with the things that he will teach. You know, in those days, they didn't have a whiteboard. Mm, they didn't have a PowerPoint. You know, I mean, so if you want to talk about a certain passage, um, not everyone would have a personal scroll with them. You know, these are all very expensive things. Uh, so the teacher would basically write on the ground. You know, um, if there is sand over there, they would, you know, maybe uh, inscribe with their finger. On the other hand, if it is just a ground where something can be written, maybe they would use something like a chalk to actually write out, uh, you know, that passage. So then when the, when the teacher is teaching and the rabbi is teaching, everyone sees what is written over there on the ground and they would follow along uh, while the rabbi explains to them each portion of that passage. So Jesus was probably engaged in the, you know, in doing this. So when they make this allegation, he ignores it. He just bends down and starts to write on the ground and he continues to do what he, you know, he has come over there to do, ignoring them pointedly. And then they keep on questioning him. And then he, you know, he uh, straightens up and he uh, replies to them. Uh, so, uh, you know, keeping this in mind, uh, if we can have someone read out for us, um, maybe we're, from verse 7 all the way up to um, verse 10. Yeah, 7 to 10, if we could have someone read out, please. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he, stop, he stood down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it be, uh, being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Yeah. When Jesus had... Re uh, verse... mm, okay, yeah, go ahead. Verse 10. 
go ahead, go ahead, yes. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? Yeah, Jesus declared, and then the last portion of the verse, it says, uh, go now and leave your life of sin. Thank you. Thank you so much for reading out. So um, Jesus says, OK, fine, you're going on questioning me regarding this. This is not something that requires me to answer you. You are the leaders. You already know what the Mosaic scriptures tell about this. So go ahead and do what the Mosaic scriptures say. You know. So he says, let anyone of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. What is he referring to? He's referring to the Mosaic scriptures. You know, in Deuteronomy chapter 19, verses 16 to 18, um, it says over there, yeah, maybe we can actually have someone read out that, uh, because that explains why Jesus says, uh, you know, whoever is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone. So if we could have someone read out Deuteronomy 19, verses 16 to 18. Deuteronomy 19. 16 to 18, please. Deuteronomy 19, 16 to 18. If a false witness rises against any man to testify against him of wrongdoing, then both men in the controversy shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who serve in those days, and the judges shall make careful inquiry. And indeed, if the witness is a false witness who has testified falsely against his brother, then you shall do to him as he thought to have done to his brother. So you shall put away the evil from among you. Yeah. So here we see that um, it's talking about a malicious witness, a false witness, someone who's giving false testimony. So the uh, the when when a testimony is given, the first thing which the judges would consider is: is this person a blameless witness, or is he a, a malicious witness? So all Jesus is saying is, you don't need me to answer this question for you. You are already familiar with the Mosaic law. So you know those of you who are genuine witnesses, those who are blameless, you know. So that's the term that is used in the original Greek. The wording over there it says, "He who is blameless." That is, he who is a true witness, a correct witness. Let that person go ahead and start the proceedings. You know, so the scripture is very clear. It says that she should be stoned. So, you know, go ahead and do that, is what he says. And, I've, and having said that, he again bends down and continues to do his writing. So it's like he's not even taking them seriously. So now the people, these leaders who have come over there are placed in a tight spot. They were asking him to open his mouth and say, oh, stone her and all that. He has not said any of that, all of those things. He just said, you know the law? You know, you know that the you know whoever is a blameless witness can go ahead and start the proceedings. So go ahead. You know, if you um, those of you who are true witnesses, throw a stone. And so over here, Jesus is not denying that you know that this lady has been caught in adultery. Yes, she has very much been in adultery. But the motive with which they have brought her, that shows the uh, the the falseness of their. Uh, you know, motives. So Jesus is, in fact, uh, focusing more on that, the wrongness of their motives in bringing her. Uh, so he says, you who consider yourself blameless, whoever considers themselves a, 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 a true, genuine witness, go ahead and throw the first stone. Now, these people do not want to get into trouble with the Roman law. They wanted to get Jesus into trouble, but they don't want to pick up the stones and start the proceedings. And so uh, what happens? Uh, we first see the older ones, probably the main uh, people who had been involved in the conspiracy. They are the ones who walk away because, I mean, they do not want to get into trouble with the Roman authorities. And then once the 
uh, elders start walking away, the rest of the group also walks away um, because obviously they were looking to the elders for you know uh, the cue to start you know creating trouble. So they all walk away, and now only the lady is left. And so he say he does not say to her what you have done is uh, you know uh, not wrong or any such um, you know silly platitudes. He very openly uh, does you know acknowledge that what she has done is sinful. So all he says is, go now and leave your life of sin. He does not condone what she has done. He does not support what she has done. He is basically saying, here I am giving you one more opportunity. I can condemn you. But rather than condemning you, I wish to give you a chance to repent. So go now and leave your life of sin. So she is given a second chance. So um, what had been a trap? Uh, set by the leaders uh, turns into something else. First, the wrong motives of the leaders is clearly exposed. And second, a woman who had indulged deliberately in sin is given a second chance. Uh, so now the choice is up to her, you know, whether she wishes, wishes to change her ways, repent and follow the Lord or whether she wishes to continue in her life of sin. That, of course, is left to her. But Jesus creates a chance for her to have a new beginning. And um, um, uh, so this passage has been inserted over here. And immediately after that, we have the uh, portion where he talks about how he is the light of the world. Uh, so maybe we can have someone read out for us John chapter 8, uh, verses 12. <laughs> Uh, to 18, yeah, uh, if someone could read out for us all the way from John chapter yeah. 8, verse 12, uh, up to verse 18. Yes, please, go ahead. John chapter 8, verse 12. Then speak Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followed, followed me shall not walk in darkness, for he but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear, a rec I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came, and whither I go. But ye cannot tell whence I come, and whither I go. He judge after the flesh. I judge no man. And yet, if I judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I am the I am, I am the Father that sent me. He also he, it is also written in your law that the testimonies of two men is true. Verse 18. I am I am one that bear witness of myself and the Father that sent me bear witness, witness of me. Amen. Amen. So here we see uh, in verse 12, uh, Jesus is speaking to the people and he says, I am the light of the world. And the promise that he makes is, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You know, so um, people who live in the kingdom of darkness are under slavery. They are under the control of the evil one. Um, even if they are trying to live a good life, uh, because they are under the control of the evil one, he can you know, um, bring a lot of destruction into their life. He can harm them. And there's not much that they can do because they are slaves of the evil one. But then those of us who become believers, we are transported from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the sun. You know, so our, our, our lives are completely changed. So this is the promise that Jesus is making over here, that if you choose to follow me, your entire citizenship will change. You will no longer be in the kingdom of darkness. In fact, now you will be in my kingdom of light. And he says, I will give that, that person the light of life, uh, is the promise that Jesus makes over here. So the Pharisees, you know, they say, ah, you're making great claims about yourself. But um, it's easy for you to say things about your own self. What about witnesses? Are there others who are testifying the same thing? We saw this conversation kind of happening earlier. This was in John chapter 5. 
um, verses 31 to 40. So over there, Jesus, in fact, gives four witnesses which testify to his divinity. Um, so if you were to go back to John chapter 5, verses 31 to 40, we see that the four witnesses which Jesus presents earlier uh, are John the Baptist, you know, because he says, I saw the Holy Spirit come and rest upon him. Uh, then he also refers to the works which he has done, the miraculous works which indicate that he is from God. Uh, the third um, uh, witness that he refers to at that time is the testimony of the father because there's a voice from heaven you know which says um, you know this is my son and I'm well pleased with him so uh, we have the testimony of the father also as a witness and the fourth witness which he gives is regarding the scriptures where he says the scriptures testify about me so um, this conversation has already happened you know in other settings with other people and now the Pharisees are bringing up the same topic once again. And now this time Jesus says, um, in verse um, 18, he says, I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. So um, it's a repetition you know, of what has already been said in John chapter 5. But I think over here, John the writer chooses to place this. Uh, because uh, he's trying to lead us into the next portion of the conversation where these um, uh, Pharisees refer to Jesus' father. Okay, so they say, they, in, in verse 19, it says, then they asked him, where is your father? And uh, this, in fact, goes on throughout this chapter where multiple times they keep referring to the father of Jesus they are actually trying to be very uh, sarcastic. They are trying to say, you know, you were born to a lady uh, who got pregnant without even, you know, be, uh, without have, even having got married. So who knows who your father is? You know, do you even know who your father is? Because Jesus is again and again saying, I am from the father. I am doing what the father has asked me to do. So they are in turn mocking him and saying, you probably don't even know who your biological father is because of the situation in which you were born. Uh, so, uh, you know, um, that aspect comes out in the, in this, um, in their repeatedly, deliberately referring to, you know, Jesus' father. Uh, so we will see that, you know, even as we go through the rest of the chapter. So here we have the first reference uh, to this. So um, if we could just read out, uh, verses 19 and 20, please. Yeah. We are in chapter Verses 8. 19. Yeah. Go ahead. Then they said to him, Where is your father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. 20. These words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one laid hands on him, for his hour has not yet come. Uh, Jesus makes a very simple statement. Uh, he ignores the, you know, the, um, the allegation which they are making, and he just simply says, if you knew me, you would know my father also. So uh, earlier in an earlier passage, he said, those who uh, are following the father, they will automatically be willing to follow me. They'll be willing to believe in me. Uh, so the two are interconnected. If we say that we want to follow the father, we want to honor his word, we want to uh, you know, obey and submit to his word, then automatically we will have openness towards receiving the son as well. In the same way, if there is an openness in our hearts to believe in the Son and in the works that He is doing and in the words that He is proclaiming, because of that openness which we have towards Him, we will automatically be open even to the Father. So um, here Jesus says, uh, if you really knew me, if you were willing to be open to what I am saying, then you would automatically know the Father as well. You know, We see this later on um, in John chapter 14, where Philip says, you know, just show us the father that's enough because you know these people have uh, these disciples are people who were eager 
for spiritual things, which is why you know they chose to come and become followers of Jesus. Uh, so uh, you know, in John 14, uh, Philip says, "Show us the Father, and that's enough for us." And Jesus says, uh, you know, in uh, John 14 verse 9, Jesus says, "Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you for, for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father." How can you say, show us the Father? So um, Jesus always makes it very clear that he and the Father are interconnected. They are one. If you have respect for the Father, you will have respect for Jesus as well. If you believe in Jesus and the miracles that he is doing, then your heart is open towards whatever the Father has to share. So uh, you know, um, this is the aspect which Jesus brings out over here. And so to these people who are rejecting him, who are not only rejecting him, but also indirectly rejecting the father, this is the word of warning that he gives to them. Um, uh, if, if we can have someone read out for us, uh, verses 21 to 24. Verse 21, then Jesus said to them again, I am going away and you will seek me and will die in your and will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. So the Jews said, Will he kill himself? Because he says, Where I go, you cannot come. And he said to them, You are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Now, again, this is a repetition uh, because, you know, in an earlier place, he, he had said, you cannot follow me. Uh, you cannot come where I am. Uh, you cannot. Yeah, you cannot come to the place that I am going. This is something that he had said in uh, John chapter 7, verses 33 to 36. So now here again, we have Jesus saying the same thing. He says, uh, when I go away and you start looking for me, uh, you will not be able to find me because where I am going, you will not be able to come. And uh, so in cha John chapter 7, when he had said this, uh, that set of Jews, you know, they ask among themselves, is he going to go away to, uh, to Egypt or to Babylon, you know, where you have uh, some of the Jewish people living? Uh, so uh, will he go over there and start preaching to the Greeks over there? Is what they ask themselves. Here they ask, uh, here, they, in fact, they make a more sarcastic remark. They say, oh, we can't go where he's going, is it? So does that, does that mean he's going to commit suicide? You know, so they, they're again being mocking. But it says in verse 21, uh, I mean, in verse 23, it says, but he continued and he said, you are from below. I am from above. And then if he, he goes on to say in the next verse, if you do not believe that I am, you will indeed die in your sins. Over there, you know, um, the phrase that Jesus uses, that Greek phrase, E-I-M-I, I me, that I am. That is the divine I am, you know, which is generally uh, used in their Greek Septuagint. So it's, it's, it's a term that they're very familiar with. So here in our English, just to kind of, uh, you know, to make the grammar more clear, uh, they write, if you do not believe that I am he. But if you look at the actual Greek, you know, if you look at the Gospel of John in the, in the original Greek, he just simply uses the term I am. If you do not believe that I am, you will indeed die in your sins. So he is actually using that term E-I-M-I, -I, that Greek term, to, to indicate who he is. So they are mocking and they're saying, oh, you know, you're, are you going to kill yourself so that we will not be able to follow you? And Jesus says to them, you know what, you're from below, but I am from above. I am the I am. So uh, uh, if you do not believe in me that I am, then you will indeed die in your sins. And that is the reason why you will not be able to come where I, I am going, because you would have died in your sins rather than being forgiven of your sins. So uh, this is the declaration that Jesus makes. And uh, so, you know, like we had said in one of the earlier classes, even as we are reading all these things, we got to keep in mind that when uh, John first wrote this gospel, uh, his immediate readers would have been the people of those days uh, when 
there was a lot of uh, struggle and persecution if you became a Christian, if you became a follower of this Jesus Christ. Uh, so at that time, uh, John writes to those people saying, these are the things which Jesus spoke. These are the things which Jesus did. Therefore, believe in him. It doesn't matter even if you're going to be persecuted because what Jesus has said is the truth. And if you believe in this truth, you know, you can have eternal life. To give them this assurance, to give them this hope, he writes this gospel. So what sounds to us like, you know, repetition, because we are so familiar with these concepts, when we think of it in the way the original readers would have, you know, received it, we kind of see the, uh, the deep emphasis, the significance of uh, these uh, things which, you know, John writes over here. So the conversation here is continuing, uh, you know, and uh, uh, they ask him in verse 25, who are you? They asked. Um, so all these things, you know, for us, it sounds very repetitive. We may thinking, oh, we already know Jesus is, the, is, you know, is the Messiah. We know that he is divine. We know that he is the son of God. But these entire dialogues, all these, you know, uh, dialogues between Jesus and the people who were opposing him and asking him all kinds of questions. Those dialogues are preserved over here so that the readers will be able to read this and grasp exactly how Jesus answered those people, what exactly he said about himself. These are all words of life which have been recorded so that the people who read this can believe, you know, right from, from, from their inner man and uh, be able to accept uh, Jesus as Lord and Savior. So here, the, uh, the people who are opposing and questioning, they ask, who are you? They ask. Uh, so if we can have someone read out for us, uh, verses 25 to 30. Verse 25, then they said to him, who are you? And Jesus said to them, just what I have been saying to you from the beginning, I have many things to say and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. They did not understand that he spoke to them of the Father. Then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself, but as my father taught me, I speak these things. And he who sent me is with me. The father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. As he spoke these words, many believed in him. It says here that now, after Jesus had said these things, even as he spoke, many believed in him because here jesus says you know i am from the father and he says whatever i do i only do you know as instructed by the father i only do what pleases him and uh, so the crowd which had been you know watching him uh, you know following uh, his story you know even as he went from place to place they were aware of what kind of a life he led. So when he says over here, um, the one who sent me is with me, he has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. They believed that what he was saying about himself. You know, nobody could find any fault in him. He was indeed living in a way which would, which would be highly pleasing to God. He had never done anything which, you know, uh, they can point fingers at and say that, see, this proves that this person is not from the Father. So Jesus is basically saying over here, um, not only am I, am I declaring that I am from the Father, look at my lifestyle. Look at the way I am living. I am genuinely living like as if I am from the Father. And I, you know, I am living in such a way that I only do what the Father has taught me, and I only uh, do what pleases Him. So, And they are not able to disprove that in any way. So when he speaks in this manner, many place their trust in him and believe him because his lifestyle speaks volumes. And uh, that should be the same even for us. Uh, when we share passionately about the things of God, about you know the scriptures, and we talk about uh, salvation and, the, and the, the salvation plan of God, and we talk about these things, uh, people are very um, 
drawn attracted because of the because of the passion with which we speak uh, you know they they can see that we really believe what we are talking about but then as the slowly gets start getting to know us they also look at our actions really because at the end of it all more than uh, the words it's our uh, life which speaks out and so if the words that we are speaking are very passionate but then our lifestyle shows something else people kind of stop taking us seriously the power of what we spoke out gets diluted by our actions by our interactions because sometimes um, you know um, in the way we interact with people are we you know being kind hearted are we being patient because people are not perfect there will be people who would you know uh, get on our nerves there are people who would hurt us there would be all kinds of things that would go on so how are we in our interactions with people how are we in the choices that we make so people not only just listen to the words that we are speaking they very much look at our lives and sometimes our life our actions speaks louder than just the words which we speak so here in the case of jesus his words and his actions matched perfectly and so when he said i only do what, what pleases the father they act, they actually had to just admit and say yes what he is saying is correct because we have we have been watching him and we see no defect in him so um now um we are still in the process of learning you know uh, to to be like jesus and we are still in the process of getting sanctified so yes we have not become perfect yet but we must make this conscious effort to always try and be more and more like christ so that people will take the message of christ which we are preaching seriously they will not take our message of christ seriously if they see that we are people who are nothing like christ they will just simply ignore us they will say okay fine this is just another philosophy that this person is pushing they will not um, but when we act it out when we live out what we are teaching they, they will say oh this person believes this to the extent that they are actually living it out even if it involves sacrifice even if it involves pain and then they will take us seriously because we we believe in this to that extent and then the holy spirit is able to work through us to convict them and help them see the truth you know god uses us as his vessels to convey this truth to them because we are um, vessels through which uh, he is able to flow so freely and there are no blockages we are living in a way that pleases him and it's so easy for him to use our tongue to use our actions to use our lifestyle to convey what he wishes to convey so the holy spirit does not just simply use us through our words he in fact uses us as complete people because paul so boldly in the epistles when he is you know uh, uh, writing to the, all these different um, churches he says you know you know the way we lived you know ha huh, the choices we made so uh, not only did paul preach jesus he also lived jesus where he says to the extent where he says you can imitate me because i am like you know i imitate christ Uh, so all these things matter so whether we are in the secular field and we are working in you know in uh, in schools and offices and in um, uh, in multinational companies people are not only listening to the words that we are saying about jesus they are also looking to see whether our actions match up and that carries power because they will see that we are willing to even make sacrifices to honor our god because we really believe that he is the living god and then they start taking us seriously uh, so uh, maybe with this thought we can go into our break and then when we come back we'll continue from verse 31 onwards all right thank you Can you switch it off? <laughs> 